Happy New Year, listeners. I hope you've had a wonderful end to 2023 and hopefully at least a little break and breather ready for the new year. Welcome to Books to Last, where usually we're joined by a reader from somewhere in this wide world and they tell us what five books they would take with them when cast away to a mystery remote location. However, this episode is a little bit different. Like last year, for the first episode of the new year, I'm instead bringing you my Books to Last from... 2023. So the best five reads that I personally read last year. Some of them may be past picks of the podcast or they might not, but they are all books that I thought were brilliant in some way and I really hope you will too and would recommend that you maybe check them out if they sound interesting to you. Before we get into the list proper, I wanted to give you a little overview of my reading year because it's possibly been my best reading year ever, both in volume and in five-star reads. Now, admittedly, I think I've been more generous with my five-star ratings this year than in previous years because I'm trying to not self-censor my own feelings about books in retrospect. And what I mean by that is I often downgrade books maybe a few days or weeks after I've read them, even though when I finished them, I really, really enjoyed them or loved something about them, and that's why I gave them five stars. But after... I don't know, thinking about it or reflecting on it or reading other people's thoughts and opinions and then seeing them make very valid points, I get a bit self-conscious that those books, whilst I love them, aren't objectively good and therefore I need to sort of, I don't know, knock off a star, which, let's be honest, is really silly because book reviews are subjective and there's enough self-inflicted shame around reading without me adding to it. So if I finish a book and I feel I really did love it and would read it again I rate it as such and I'm trying to stick with that and not try and change my past opinions which I think in some cases I do genuinely think I got swept up in the hype and then I never think about that book again and go oh it probably isn't a five-star read because I'm not going to read it again but if it is a book that you know I really really enjoyed personally then yeah I'm going to try and stick to it stick to my guns so the quality isn't super surprising to me but the volume of reading I actually managed to do last year was a big surprise to me. I've had a really really busy year. I have done lots of things in both personal, professional study, all that sort of thing. I graduated, I moved house and for the past few years I've been reading less but sort of gradually ramping it up and for all of last year to be honest I didn't think I was reading that much because it wasn't consistent throughout the year there were you know slumps or spells where I was either too ill or too busy or too tired to read anything Um, and I've not actively forced myself to try and read more or finish specific books I basically just read when I wanted to and more or less what I wanted to But despite that, I still ended up reading a total of 84 books according to Goodreads, although I know three of those were DNFs. And this tops a previous record, which I think was 2018. And this is just really nice news for me personally, because 2020, the year that should not be named, honestly kicked a hole in my reading mojo, as well as my health, uh, mental health, I should say. And rebuilding this very fundamental element of my self-care that being reading um, after becoming a mom in 2021 especially has been to put it lightly a bit of an uphill battle Uh, I find it quite hard to do things just for myself and reading is one of those things that I do just for myself so re-establishing this hobby I suppose um, has been something that I've wanted to reclaim and I've been really glad that it feels like I'm kind of there. So that was really good, but enough of all that sentimental rubbish. Uh, Let's talk about the books that I read and which ones were good, most importantly. So they're in no particular order, and the first book I'm going to share with you is a book called The Architect's Apprentice by Elif Shafak, if I'm pronouncing that right. Hopefully I am. This is a book that's been on my TBR for years and years and years, mainly because I saw the word architect and I really like buildings, and I was like, ooh, buildings apprentice because I was starting apprenticeship in a building related profession and I was like oh I'll read that then and then you know I bought it and promptly didn't read it for about seven years I finally got around to it last year and it was so worth the wait and it was amazing and I shouldn't have been surprised as I was because I've heard of Elif Shafak and I know that she's an amazing author and she's incredibly acclaimed and is known to write these kinds of books that are 
thoughtful and emotional and explore cultures and love and all of these huge themes but essentially the story of the architect's apprentice is about a young boy and his elephant and their journey through their whole lives basically uh, it starts with him as a child and also the elephant being born and follows them through all sorts of really monumental historical events that many of which actually did happen and spanning the height I would say of the Ottoman Empire which is another topic I've gotten very interested in this year because I listened to the Empire podcast uh, by Goalhanger podcast which is presented by two historians and they started with the British occupation of India and then they moved on to the Ottoman Empire and several other topics they've done the Russian Empire very recently and they're currently doing the Persian Empire if history is a topic you're really interested in and you want to hear two incredibly insightful historians pick apart what empire and colonialism and that sort of and those topics mean um, for the world, it's a really, really interesting podcast. And learning about the Ottoman Empire from them made the Arctic's Apprentice a really enjoyable experience for me because it was really, really interesting to see these historical events that I'd learned about from a theoretical point of view interwoven with this really beautiful, well-written prose. Um, yeah, lots of focus on artistry, culture, love and loyalty and politics. And it's a really, really interesting book. And I didn't really see where it was going. I never knew what was going to happen. And I found the characters really interesting. And the main character is really lovable. I love the elephant. He's great just a great character despite the fact he obviously has no dialogue so that was my first book the second book i probably don't need to give much of an introduction uh it's the two towers by J.R.R. tolkien uh, the second book in the lord of the rings series i continued my lord of the rings buddy read with my best friend last year we read the second and third installments as well as watching the extended cuts of both films the Two Towers, I think, was by far my favourite of the whole series because the Ents and Merry and Pippin are definitely my favourite characters and they get a big role to play in The Two Towers. There's also a lot less walking, a lot more battles, and that's all really fun. And, uh, yeah, I just enjoyed The Two Towers the most. It was so funny. I laughed out loud in multiple instances. If you, like me, have gotten this far in life and not read, read The Lord of the Rings... I do recommend giving it a go. I have really enjoyed it. If the writing style or, I don't know, everything you've heard about how much walking there is puts you off, I do recommend the audiobooks as well, which I managed to borrow from my library using the Libby app. They're actually very nice to walk to because if the characters are in fact walking, you kind of feel like you're with them, especially if you're out in nature somewhere. I did lots of dog walks whilst listening to this and I also read alongside it with my paperback copies when I could. Also on The Two Towers, I found, the reason I found the Ents so interesting was because I found the chapter tree beard, I highlighted so much of that chapter because so much of what the Ents talk about and say, I find still really prescient for environmentalism and environmental activism now. And it really felt as though Treebeard was speaking on behalf of all of nature when he completely lambasted the way they've been treated by both men and orcs and all of that sort of thing, all of the other characters in Middle Earth. And, you know, sort of very poignantly asked the question, why should we help anybody? Nobody helps us. And yeah, I just really, really loved it. And I felt like the Two Towers had a lot to say even now and yeah I can see why it's such an amazing series I really do recommend other people that read it as well uh, my best friend and I have really enjoyed reading it together the third book on my list of books to last for 2023 is Love Theoretically by Ali Hazelwood if you are not familiar with the Steminist Romances by Ali Hazelwood I recommend you go and read them all immediately I think no I know 
Love theoretically is my favourite of them so far and I think it probably won't be dethroned anytime soon. I liked how these characters, whilst still using a lot of the same tropes from the first two books, are very, very different from the two characters in the first two books. I liked the sort of setup of the relationship and this book literally made me sob the first time I read it and I've cried every time I've reread it as well. The same scene gets me every single time. And I found Elsie a very personally relatable character, more so than the protagonist in the previous two uh, books. Even though I really enjoyed those books, I just think I related to Elsie a lot more and I just loved Jack. I think he's excellent and a very, very healthy <laughs> minded person which sounds like a strange thing to say about a love interest but you know what you've got to love somebody who's sorted out their own issues mostly so yeah love theoretically it's fun it's funny it's a great rom-com and also kind of heartfelt and emotional and really explores so many issues including things like chronic illness and trying to look after yourself when you don't have a good job um in and therefore don't have health care or health insurance and that sort of thing. So lots of topics, but also just you can go along for the ride and not necessarily get too bogged down in the emotional parts as well. Although I challenge you to not cry during that particular sequence because it's really, really, really emotional. The fourth book in my list is The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orxy. Again, I hope I've pronounced that right. This is the original superhero novel set during the French Revolution, written at the start of the 20th century. I have had this book on my TBR for ages, mainly because it was marketed as the first superhero, and I was like, I like superheroes. I should read about the first one. And so that's what I did eventually last year, about five years later. But it was absolutely so, so, so worth it. And I found out that it's the first in a series. She's written like 35 installments for this series. So I can't wait to get into the rest of them. But The Scarlet Pimpernel is, it's short, it's adventurous. It's got heroes and romance and jeopardy and comedy. And I really, really enjoyed every minute of it. And that's surprising because I generally don't like books set during the French Revolution. I don't know whether it's because it's particularly gory as revolutions go. Um, I often come away from most books about the French Revolution feeling as though there were no winners and there was no justice and generally they're all kind of dark and depressing because let's be honest the French Revolution was but then again I come from the only country that had a revolution to reinstate its king so you know there is that. Um <laughs> What I've said is when I've been trying to get other people to read The Scarlet Pimpernel, because I feel like not enough people have, uh, it's kind of just like Batman. It's Batman, but it's before Batman. And I think this book lays a lot of the groundwork for basically how we think about superheroes today, because most of those tropes that previously to this book didn't really exist um, are laid out here into including like secret identity and oh, just plotting and bad guys and almost sort of comically ridiculous villains. It's a really exceptional book. It's really, really short as well. And I think it's a classic that is definitely undersold and more people should read. Um, my fifth and final book is probably going to come as no surprise to most people because everyone I know who's read this book loves it. And it's The Song of Achilles by Madeleine Miller. I am so glad I finally got around to reading this. Just before I read this, I actually read The Iliad by Homer, which this is a retelling of, which meant even though I was fresh from knowing exactly what was going to happen in this book, it made it no less heart-wrenching and immersive, and it was just a really beautiful, lyrically written book. And I usually hate that phrase because generally if someone tells me something's written lyrically, I'll be like, oh, I don't want to read that because I don't do flowery language. However, it's so readable. I was expecting it to be a really hard time to read uh, because of I knew the subject matter. I just expected it to be quite difficult to get through. But it's so readable and I could just dip in and out of it. I had to take a few breaks because... Achilles or Patroclus would say something to each other and 
it would foreshadow something that I knew was going to happen later on and I would just get heartbroken all over again and have to go away and then come back and try and pull myself together. But yes, it's a retelling of ancient Greek myth of the Trojan War, the Iliad. It's gorgeous. I understand why everyone loves it. It's well lauded and I'm really excited to read more of Madeline Miller's work now because it was a really good one to start off on. Now, looking back on my list, I've only just noticed that four of the five books I've picked are written by female authors, which makes me feel quite good. Uh, not because I did anything in particular, because it wasn't intentional, but I have in the past um, read read a lot of male authors. That's been I'm generally, I think because I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, which tends to be dominated by a lot of male authors, I have always leaned more that way in my statistics, but it's been quite nice to see that I have so many female authors on this list. So that's great. So to recap, my top five books in no particular order are The Architect's Apprentice by Elif Shafak, The Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien, Love Theoretically by Ali Hazelwood, The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orksey, and The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. They were definitely in my top five, but I had a lot of close runners up, I should suppose. So my honorable mentions, I do have a few. Uh, The first is The Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. And I have another Agatha Christie also as an honorable mention. um, And then there were none. Now, The Murder on the Orient Express, I did not know the outcome of. and, And then there were none, I did know the outcome of. Regardless, Agatha Christie is such a fantastic mystery writer. I felt like I was completely in both of those worlds. One is set on a train, one is set on a big house on an island. And I felt like I was there. And weirdly, because there's so many characters in both of them, often they go back to their rooms and sit and read a book before bed because of the time it's set in. It's not like they were watching TV. Uh, So when you are sat with your book and in sort of bed or the sofa I was often reading this late at night and it was very dark and I couldn't see sort of out of my own little bubble of light where my reading light was so I could I got so drawn in that I often felt like I was you know on the Orient Express in my little sleeper carriage reading my book and I kind of had to look up and remind myself that no one was gonna sneak in and murder me or something um and yeah just Agatha Christie she's fantastic she doesn't need me to say that obviously um but I do recommend if you haven't read any Agatha Christie those are great ones to start with I really really enjoyed them the second or I suppose I should say third of my honorable mentions is Rebecca by Daphne de Maurier. I'm going to apologise for that pronunciation. I cannot pronounce French words, even when people tell me how you pronounce them. I, I think it's French. It, pro- it it looks French. Anyway, <laughs> Rebecca is one that I'd read, I'd seen the movie, so I knew basically what it was about. But even despite that, it's so atmospheric. It's probably my first proper gothic book. Um closest to horror I've probably ever come and I really really enjoyed it I read it in a really short period of time it's just so well written and it's definitely another one of those I think slightly undersold classics that more people should read next one I'll mention is The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow sequel to The Watchmaker of Feligri Street really fun really amazing sequel I say fun really excellent sequel I say fun because I know how it ends, <laughs> but an excellent sequel that really lived up to the first book. The first book was my absolute favourite book at the time I read it, and Natasha Polly is a superb writer, and I love everything of hers that I've written. It's set during Victorian times, although this instalment, they go to Japan. It's about a gay couple called uh, Maury and Nathaniel, and they are just wonderful they're stark polar opposites it's it's about clairvoyancy there's a sort of fantasy element but it never actually feels properly like a fantasy it definitely is but I think non-fantasy lovers could really enjoy the watchmaker of Feligu Street and the lost future of Pepper Harrow as well and I'm so glad I finally read the sequel and I'm so glad it lived up to it I think the reason I put it off for so long was probably because 
I was worried that it wouldn't live up to the first one. I also read the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson last year. It's a good fantasy series. It's not one of my favourite series of all time, but it felt like it was worth a mention because it's unlike most fantasy... Well, it's unlike any fantasy series I've read before, which is saying something because I've read a lot of fantasy. So I really, really enjoyed it. And I have only ever read Skyward by Brandon and Sanderson, but I do want to get into the rest of his books. But there are so, so many. So I feel like it might be a job for next year because I want to try and get through my current TBR before I start taking on the likes of Brandon Sanderson and Robin Hobb. Um, my next two honourable mentions are graphic novels, uh, Super Sons Volume 1 and We Are Robin Volume 1. They are both recommendations from the Geek History Lesson podcast. They are both great, mainly because they both have Robins in them. I really, really love Damian Wayne and I'm saying that here purely for the benefit of my good friend Ashley because I know she violently disagrees with me and I know she listens. Uh, yeah, so I really love Damian Wayne. I love him in Super Sons Volume 1. I'm so glad I went back to the beginning of the series because I've read a lot of other volumes of Super Sons. I don't know why I'm reading them out of order. The next book is No Shame by Tom Allen, which is a sort of memoir, autobiography uh, from the comedian Tom Allen. If you don't know him, he's very funny, very dry, very witty, very self-deprecating, and I just love him so much. He co-presents the Bake Off for the Professional Show, which is a spin-off of the Great British Bake Off, for anyone who's interested. I do recommend that as well. It's a great show. And yeah, No Shame by Tom Allen. I know he's released a few others since this one, but I listened to the audiobook, which he narrates, and that was a great way to experience that book. Women and Girls with Autism Spectrum Disorder by Sarah Hendricks is another one on my honourable mentions, a non-fiction book that I wanted to give a slight mention to because it is really well written, it's really well researched and it really helped me during my own process of being diagnosed and trying to understand what that meant for me uh, in my wider life and try and, I don't know, see my life and the world around me through this new lens that I had um, as opposed to just not really understanding any of it. So yeah, Women and Girls with Autism Spectrum Disorder is a really great book and it's a really cohesive and comprehensive guide on how ASD affects women and girls differently to men because it's only recently been acknowledged that that could even be possible because you know heaven forbid anyway the next book on my honorable mentions is torrid times by peter brooks it is a compilation of political cartoons by the times newspaper political cartoonist peter brooks i got this while i was at Cheltenham literature festival peter brooks signed it he is wonderful and funny and his political cartoons are fantastic. I'm a bit of a nerd for political cartoons. I do collect books of political cartoons, one of my little niches, I suppose. And these ones are from the last few years. So they're all commemorating news events that I was present for and, and you know, observed as a member of the public. I'm quite looking forward to having this set for posterity later on in life, but just generally they're, they're just great, really high quality pieces of artwork. So I wanted to get a copy. Last is a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I will say it's probably not one of my favourites of all times, but I really enjoyed it. I read it at Christmas and I felt like I had to mention it because I don't really like Charles Dickens's writing usually, but I really did enjoy Christmas Carol. I think it's a great book to read around Christmas and it sounds so corny, but um, I read a few books around Christmas, many of which kind of discussed, you know, the meaning of Christmas and in a completely, because I'm, not religious myself, in just a very emotional way, connecting to the non-commercial side of Christmas and what it means to individuals was good. So A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens was one of those Christmas books. Another one was Last Christmas, which is a compilation by Greg Wise and Emma Thompson and has contributions from everyone from Amelia Clark to Meryl Streep to refugees and asylum seekers coming to the UK and volunteers who work for the Crisis Appeal. It's a really 
touching anthology and i also recommend people check that one out so that's last christmas um curated by greg wise and emma thompson so that's all of my honorable mentions that is my full list i had a really great year last year i think i can say that now because i'm out of it it was a very stressful year if you have a top book or top five books from 2023 i would really love to hear about them so if you wanted to share them with me you can do that on at books to last pod on instagram thank you very much for listening and until next time bye for now Music.